So I, I'm, I'm sort of always thinking from that perspective. And so what, what we sort of work on is um, approaches to try to uh, study protein dynamics at a very fundamental level to see if we can understand how evolution tailors proteins for function. That's a very biophysical project. Then we have, as Sam mentioned, a, an effort to understand novel antibiotics and oh, it's, it's novel approaches to, to addressing the problem of, of, of uh, the absence of novel antibiotics. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is our effort to de develop a, a natural base pair with which to expand the genetic alphabet. So just to bring everyone up uh, to, on, the, to, on the same page, there it is. That's the genetic alphabet of E. coli. In fact, that's a fraction of the genetic alphabet of E. coli. You can't see it. Let me blow it up for you. There it is. So I gave, I gave this talk in China a year ago, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, you got a lot of nerve showing the Japanese flag in China. <laughs> but here it is. So it's just, DNA, I mean, remarkably, I mean, to a chemist, DNA is a pretty unremarkable molecule. It's a polymer, right? It's just a long string of these phosphodiester bonds with these nitrogenous bases, GCA and T. What makes DNA utterly unique and remarkable is the specific pairing. G pairs with C, A pairs with T. No other molecule has that level of, of molecular record. And it's that molecular recognition that allows it to encode all the information in life, all the information possible in life, all the information that's ever been in life. Since the last common ancestor of all life on Earth, it's been this way, a four-letter, two-base pair alphabet. My group, when we started in 1999, after I left Berkeley, it was San, San Diego was a little tough for me to get used to, but my group decided that one of the things we were interested in trying to do was see if we could develop uh, a fifth and a sixth letter that constitute a third base pair, an unnatural base pair. So what would, why, would you, why would you want to do that? So here's my representation of a cell. For those biologists in the lab, it's, in, in the room, it's obviously a gram-negative organism because I'm putting a little paraplasm there. So this is my representation of a cell. I do want to mention the seminal work of Pete Schultz and Steve Benner, um, and I'll come to that in a second. But if one's interested in expanding the genetic alphabet, there's a couple things you'd have to be concerned with. You'd have to have some sort of G DNA element, a chromosome, plasmid, whatever, that has the unnatural nucleotide in it. You'd have to have the cognate unnatural nucleotide triphosphate, which is the substrate for DNA polymerases that replicate that DNA. Uh, you'd have to have it available within the cell, and you obviously have to have uh, the polymerase be able to recognize this and be able to incorporate it opposite its partner in DNA. And then you'd have to have the same story with RNA. You'd have to have the ribonucleoside analogs in, 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 available within the cell as triphosphates. You'd have to have an RNA polymerase that synthesizes messenger RNA. The messenger RNA then goes out in the cytoplasm and directs protein synthesis. Now, the reason I'm acknowledging Peter Schultz and Steve Benner here, Pete uh, has actually um, expanded the genetic code already. And the way he did it was be taking amber stop codons and, uh, uh, and, and switching the, the anticodon of a tRNA such that it recognizes the amber stop codon. I think that's brilliant. I think it deserves a Nobel Prize. Yeah. But it's actually very limited because 
you're competing with release factors. Cells don't want to use stop codons to code amino acids. And even if you got them to work magically the, in, in the best case scenario, you'd only ever incorporate one. And think of what's going on. You're incorporating that same unnatural amino acid at every stop, amber stop codon in the genome. So the cells aren't healthy, and, they, and as a result, they're just difficult to work with. But it's absolutely brilliant. And our idea was simply, look, let's not have to reappropriate a stop codon. Let's create new ones that never existed in nature, that aren't competing with anything, they're not pleiotropically entangled with any other facet of the, of, of the physiology of the cell. And we'd get a whole bunch of new ones, more new ones than you could ever use. But Pete used this amber stop codon and he evolved synthetases. So synthetases are the enzymes that recognize tRNAs and charge them with the amino acid so that that charged tRNA can participate in protein synthesis. Pete critically evolved unnatural Synthetate, modifications of synthetases such that they recognize a tRNA and charge it with an unnatural amino acid, like I said, which he encoded for an amber stop codon. We plan on full scale stealing his system, his synthetases and tRNAs, but simply recoding them once all this works with the unnatural base pairs to allow for you to drive, to encode information for that unnatural amino acid anywhere on a protein and many different ones. So, so that's, of course, why I want to acknowledge Pete. Um, and uh, Steve Benner, I also want to acknowledge, he's at the, uh, the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution because Steve was really the first person to popularize the idea of developing an unnatural base pair. And I'll talk briefly about what his strategy was in a second. But, so getting back to why we'd want to do this, if we could then drive protein synthesis, if we could encode unnatural proteins, proteins with unnatural amino acids, there are uh, revolutionary applications that we, that we could uh, hopefully apply that to. Um, protein therapeutics have, has unbelievable, absolutely revolutionized medicine um, to the point that most of the new uh, drugs that are in development now are proteins. But proteins are constrained by being made up of only 20 natural amino acids. And what could you do if you had one, two, three other types of amino acids that you could select on and build proteins containing? It would, it would, it would uh, uh, in principle, allow uh, the development of, of drugs um, that are much more efficacious. And so that's something that a long-term goal that we're very interested in. So what Steve's idea was when he was interested in developing unnatural base pairs was he, he took G and C and simply switched the hydrogen bonding patterns. He called them ISO-C and ISO-G. Actually, actually, Alex Rich in 1962 was the first to suggest that. But Steve then uh, worked on developing that. And the problem that he ran into is you can switch the H bond donors and acceptors, but anyone who's taken you know, the Sam's uh, organic chemistry class knows what tautomerization is. And that simply switches you back. And what bit Steve in the butt was they, 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 it was fidelity. They mispaired. His, his modified G would tautomerize the pair with C. So we took a different approach. We said, look, let's use nucleotide analogs that can't tautomerize. So what I'm showing here is the nucleobase part. And learn, a lot of them aren't even basic. But I'll call them nucleobases for simplicity. And I'm not going to show the sugar and the phosphate backbone or the triphosphate that's part of these analogs. I'm only focusing on just that nucleobase part. And there's a couple things I want to say about them. Number one, there's no H bonding functionality here. There's nothing that's going to tautomerize. From the very beginning, the idea that we wanted to pursue was trying to use hydrophobics and packing effects to underlie base pairing. Not complementary hydrogen bonding. Hydrophobic packing and the hydrophobic effect. Anyone who likes salad and mixes oil and water knows that the hydrophobic effect is a strong force. Water and oil separate. Water doesn't mix with oil. So if we had oil-like bases, the idea was they would not want to mix with water-like bases, the natural bases, and they would only mix, pair, with other oil-like analogs. So we thought maybe we'd be able to buy our way out of the problem that Steve came into by developing these analogs. So the, uh, another thing I want to say about them is they're not H, there's no, there's no complementary H bonding possible, no watson crick hydrogen bonding possible. But, and they're all large, or large and aromatic. Because just look at a duplex, right? If you take out that H bonding, what else is going to stabilize it? You need these packing interactions. So if we're taking out the H bonds, the early idea was, well, you better replace them with something, so let's replace them with, by giving them a lot of ability to pack. So that's why they're all large and aromatic. So that's one thing that I want to say about them. They're, large, they're hydrophobic, large, and aromatic. And the second thing I want to say about them that's sort of unique to our program was there's a lot of them. We didn't want to take the sort of traditional chemical biology approach where we make something and then spend five years studying it because we didn't know how to design them. 
We wanted to take, I'm very impressed with medicinal chemists, and I'm very impressed with the techniques that they use. So we wanted to imitate that. We wanted to, 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 to make things quickly, have assays that can quickly evaluate them so that we can find out if a modification made it better or worse, build what's called structure activity relationships, SARs, and use that information in the design process to optimize it and just iteratively keep going like this, making new, analyze, new analogs, building SAR, using feeding back, designing new analogs, getting better and better SAR. And so that's why there's a lot of them. So in the lab, this has become known, this sort of set right here, as sort of the first generation analogs. And they were these large aromatic guys. Now, the assays that we wanted to use was thermal stability. How st when you put these guys in a duplex DNA, so X and Y right there, are, are they stabilizing? And so this, this, is a this is called a thermal melt. Turns out that the optical absorption of a, D of a piece of DNA changes when it's duplex and single stranded. So you can see that change right here. It's absorbing more light here, less light here, and here's a transition, and this transition reflects the dissociation of the DNA into two strands. That's related in actually a kind of a complex way to stability. And then here's the kinetic assay. So we would use something called steady state kinetics, where you give a primer and a template, and you give it a polymerase. DNA polymerase is the enzyme replicating DNA. And there's two steps. The first step is it takes the triphosphate, and it incorporates, in this case, let's say Y, and incorporates it across from X. We call that the incorporation step. It's incorporating it, the unnatural triphosphate. We also call it the unnatural base pair synthesis step, because that's the step where you're actually making the pair. But after you make the pair, you then have to continue synthesis. You've got an aberrant, aberrant, I shouldn't use that word, an unnatural primer term, aberrant is <coughs> such a judgmental term. You've got an unnatural primer terminus, and it now has to then continue synthesis by incorporation of the next nucleotide, the next correct nucleotide. So we call that the unnatural base pair extension step. So incorporation or synthesis and extension. Those, those are the two steps. Now, the SAR that came out of that first generation analog, the, the strongest SAR that was there was that these large surface area, large aromatic surface area, facilitates synthesis and it kills extension. So we solved the structure in collaboration with Dave Wimmer here at Berkeley and Pete Schultz. I don't know how we can see this or not. Here's the space filling model. Here's a little bit easier of a rendering to see. So, in our initial design, we just made lots of these. We weren't designing them and pairing each other specifically. We just made lots and analyzed all possible combinations. And one thing we found, in fact, the best base pair here wasn't a hetero pair. I mean, it wasn't X and Y. It was actually X and X. We call that a self pair. It's a propinyl isocarbyl styro. So in my early talks, in my early days, I spent a lot of time trying to justify the use of a self pair because our best analogs were self pairs. Our best today are header pairs. So if you think a self pair is weird, I don't care, so do I. But I needed to tell you what they are just for the historical perspective. So our first analog was this, the first thing that we became interested in was this self, this PIX self pair. So like the other first generation analogs, it was made wildly well. In fact, only about a hundredfold less than a natural base pair. But it wasn't extended at all. And when we solved the structure, we kind of saw why. So he, the, the pairs, I mean, everyone knows what a Watson Crick pair right, does. It, it, they, they pair in a planar edge-to-edge -edge manner. Our guy's not doing this. It's, they're they're cross-strand intercalating. So they can pick up these packing interactions. And maybe you're not surprised because they're large and they're aromatic and they look like they're probably going to do that. Um, in our mind's eye, this explained the replication. So if you imagine this is the template and this is a growing primer, if the same mode of interaction occurs during synthesis, when you, when you synthesize the pair, you're going to get this interaction, and this hydrophobic guy is going to come out of water. That's great. He doesn't want to be in water. He's hydrophobic. That was the point. He's going to pick up all these stacking and these packing interactions. That's great. But to the extent that it has to distort to allow that to happen, it's going to, the majority of the distortion is going to be borne by the primer terminus because the template's more locked down by the plumbers. That's going to misposition this hydroxyl group, which is required for chemistry for the extension step. So we envision, we believe, that this mode of pairing was optimized and, and it was great for synthesis, but it was bad for extension. So the next set of analogs, the next generation of analogs we designed were simply to pull back on the size and like, look, we had had such success in optimizing the pair for synthesis and then we just couldn't get any extension. We said, look, let's take smaller analogs 
less prone to cross train and tercolate, and see if we can't optimize that synthesis step in a context that will be easier to optimize the extension step as well. So we made lots of analogs, and again, very medicinal chemistry-like approach, where we tried to systematically examine effects, methyl groups in all different arrangements, fluoro substituents, nitrogen heteroamine substituents, other halogens, some thiophenes, some O-methyls. And the SAR that came out of this was deeply troubling. Let me briefly explain it. The single most important position was the position ortho to the glycosidic linkage. So this is the glycosidic linkage. In this case, it's a carbon. It's a C glycoside. This is an N glycoside. So it's the glycoside meaning it's linked to the sugar. The single most important position was that position ortho, immediately adjacent. So here, 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 and here. It's the most important position. The SAR was clear. For the synthesis step, whether the nucleobase analog was in the template or in, as the incoming triphosphate, you wanted that ortho substituent to be hydrophobic. Not a surprise, right? That's the whole strategy we're taking. Picking, you're forcing it to want to get out of water, want it to pair in a very hydrophobic environment. Now for the extension step, this next step, once you've made XY to continue synthesis, for the nucleobase and the template, you still want it to be hydrophobic. That's great. Here's the problem. When it's at the primer terminus, you need it to be hydrophilic. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic are opposites. How can you have one functional group that satisfies both? So we actually started to worry that the physical chemical properties required for synthesis and extension were incompatible with each other. So it's troubling. So I was lucky, I had a couple, a very talented graduate student, a very talented postdoc, who went into the freezer. They set, up, they set up two independent screens. And they went into the freezer and they got 60 nucleotide analogs that we had enough of that we could use in the screen. And I'm not going to go through the details of the screen, but they're completely independent. One is a very low-brow, gel-based, brute force screen. One was a very elegant, parallel, high-throughput plate screen. Each of them screened independently 60 by 60, right? 3,600 candidate unnatural base pairs. Each of them identified the same single top pair. Right here. It's now our hetero pair, so again, if you think cell pairs are weird, that's fine. Here's our hetero pair. At this instant, I began to think cell pairs were weird too. So this, was, this came out, this was a second generation analog. This was the second of a methyl methoxy series. And this was actually a first generation analog. This was a 5 methyl sulfur isocarbyl styrol. This, now remember that, 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 that contradiction in the physical chemical property of the ortho substituent that's so worried us? Sulfur is a compromise. Between, it, 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 it's still able to accept a hydrogen bond, which is why it needs to be hydrophilic. It needs to accept a hydrogen bond from the polymerase. But it's much more hydrophobic than oxygen. So it's sort of a compromise. And this O-methyl is just a bond rotation away from, preventing a hydro, from, from prevent, presenting a hydrophobic surface versus an oxygen H-bond acceptor. I, I don't think we ever would have designed that, but it came out of the screen. Having identified this header pair, it immediately reinvigorated our, our design efforts. And we, uh, about a year later, filled this, after about 20 more analog synthesized, filled this quadrant of MMO2 out, resulting in this, what we call naphthal methoxy. And then last year, we actually reported this, TPT3 as an analog, as, as a partner for NAM that's a little bit better than 5.6 as a partner for NAM. Now, the truth is, this is pretty good. This is a little bit better, but this is really good. Um, and because we validated so much of, with this, I'm going to talk, most of the rest of my talk, about this pair. Uh, this one will come back at the end to be important a little bit. And so don't forget TPT3. But for the moment, I'm going to talk about this pair, NAM56. This was the first pair where we could PCR amplify, right? So you, I don't know if you're familiar with PCR reactions where you have a polymerase, you amplify. And it was the first time we could actually do that. And so we were really excited. Um, the problem was that we could no longer measure its, its efficiency by kinetics. Because when you looked at steady state kinetics, 
it was synthesized as fast as a natural base pair. And the reason that is because they're both being limited by product association. And all that tells you is the chemistry step now is no longer rate limiting. Steady, steady state kinetics only ever measures the rate limiting step. So all we can say is that like a natural base pair, it's chemistry step where you actually incorporate the nucleoside onto the primary terminus and extend it. Both those steps are now faster than, you could, than we can measure with steady state kinetics. And it's good enough for PCR, but how do we actually measure it? So what we do now is we, we PCR amplify it, and we measure using real-time PCR the growth of the product. That gives you a read of, uh, on efficiency. And then we take the amplicons, I love this, and we simply give this to our sequencing facility, our core facility. And they simply put it into a standard Sanger sequencing reaction. Now, of course, a standard se sequence, a Sanger sequence reaction doesn't contain our unnatural triphosphates. So what happens is, if you look at the standard chromatogram, the trace, where you sequence them, you see this normal trace, and then you see an abrupt termination. And that abrupt termination is at the exact spot of the unnatural base pair. So this is sequencing from one end with one primer, and this is sequencing from the other end, and they both terminate at exactly the same spot. Now, the read-through gives you a way to measure retention from the PCR reaction. So, to, in order to, because the PCR reaction, which is required for the analysis of a piece of DNA, introduces a little bit of mispattern, we have to we have to produce a calibration curve. So what we do is we to do so what we did is we took some synthetic DNA that was either fully natural or contained our natural base pair. So this is synthetic. I mean, made in a machine, so you know exactly what it is, and we mixed the two in controlled ratios. Then we put them through the assay where we PCR amplified and sequenced and got the ratios. And so that, that allowed us to, and since we, we could determine what the ratio was, but, and we knew what the, 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 the actual composition was, we could construct a calibration curve that allowed us to link a, a ratio to an actual percentage. So that allows us to ratio these amplitudes before and after the unnatural base pair, and then from that determine what the percentage of retention of the unnatural base pair was, and then you simply normalize that for amplification level. And that gives you a fidelity. So that's, so that's how we measure efficiency and fidelity now that steady state, uh, that we're too fast for steady state kinetics. So one thing that we immediately did, we wanted to look at sequence content. So I didn't go into this, but during what wound up being 12 years of that optimization that I sort of just skimmed over in a couple of slides, we, we, that assay, that med chem like assay that I talked about, we didn't use one polymerase, we used four, because we didn't want to get locked into something jury rigged for one polymerase. We also didn't use one sequence, we used four. And so, because we didn't want to, again, optimize it for a specific sequence context and, and, um, and then uh, not have it useful for any other sequence context. So we were pretty sure that we actually uh, had a general base pair, but we wanted to characterize that, so we looked at a bunch of different sequence contexts. And of course, this is only the local sequence context. I'm only showing you the three nucleotides on each side. It's actually 180 Merck that was amplified 10 to the 12 fold, so this isn't tenfold. This is legitimate amplification, massive amplification. Here are the efficiencies. These are relative to a natural base pair being 100%. Here are the fidelities. So they're high. You can even replicate DNA containing two adjacent unnatural base pairs. Now what's going on here? We're trying to actually examine sequence bias. Is there any sequences that are bad? Meaning they lose the unnatural base pair. If they did, then you would then somewhere in here you'd see an erosion, a, a, a good sequence, and that would erode, sorry, a sequence that would lose the unnatural base pair, and that would erode this fidelity. And the fact that it doesn't is suggestive that there aren't any sequences that are particularly problematic. Now, we really wanted to drill down on that and really carefully analyze that, because we wanted to say the base pair is replicable in any sequence context. So this is a little technical, and so I'll sort of try to talk through it briefly. Um, what we did to, uh, to, to detect this is we synthesized a piece of DNA where we, where we uh, randomized the 20 nucleotides on each side completely randomly amongst all possible nucleotides. We then amplified it in a PCR reaction. We amplified it 10 to the 24 fold. That's a mole. Okay, we had to dilute it out three times a million fold or the DNA would have filled my office. Every 10 to the three-fold amplification, we took out an aliquot. By the way, there's two reactions going in parallel. There's one that had our unnatural base pair, and there's one that had an AT. So you have these two reactions. 
Each of them amplified 10 to the 24 fold. Each of them, every 10 to the 3 fold amplification, an aliquot taken out and put through one more round of PCR, where one of our analogs is biotinylated. The biotin tag is just a tag that binds to a devonin that allows you to separate them. So we could separate the duplexes. So I mean, even with 99.9% .9 fidelity, if you amplify 10 to the 24 fold, you're going to lose some. So we wanted to separate those populations into the populations that retained the unnatural base pair and the population that lost the unnatural base pair. We separate those populations and then subjected them to deep sequencing on an Illumina sequencing platform where each of them had a minimum. So two population, two, two templates, each, ten, each, each aliquot taken at 10 to the 3 through 10 to the 24 fold, separated into two populations. So how many is that? Two times, how many 10 to the 3s are in 10, 24? What's 24 divided by 38? Eight. Eight times two times two. Every one of those populations sequenced with a minimum of 1.6 million reads. I mean, that's what happens when you have a, a luminous sequencer. You can sequence a lot. And then a statistical analysis performed. So here's the single nucleotide bias analysis. So what this is is a little complicated. I apologize. FREL minus one. FREL is the frequency of this nucleotide, or this one, or this one, or this one at these positions, minus 10 to plus 10 in the strand of DNA. It's the frequency of that nucleotide at that position in the strand that had the unnatural base pair relative to the strand that didn't. So FREL, minus, FREL being uh, greater than 1 means that when you put the unnatural base pair there, it likes to have this or this or this nucleotide at this position. An FREL value less than one means that it doesn't like that, meaning that when you put that in natural base pair there, this nucleotide is bad. It's a sequence incompatibility. And the reason we use FREL minus one simply shifts that whole thing to zero. Negative values mean it's bad. Positive value means it's good. You don't want either, right? You don't want the unnatural base pair to make some sequences better, and you don't want the unnatural base pair to make some sequences worse. You want everything to be zero. So here's this 10 to the 3 out to the 10 to the 24 fold. So here's the 0, because by 10 to the 3, there's no bias. But as you start to amplify in the population that retained and the population that lost, you see biases start to grow. The biggest bias there is for a C immediately before NAM in one of the strands. That means that it kind of likes that. That sequence replicates a little bit better than anything else. That's a bias for 4. That's not good. But to gauge you how big it is, the library that we started, it went, should have been 12.5, right? It should have been 1.8. But these are the vagaries of chemical coupling efficiencies on a DNA synthesizer. Started at 18.7. After 10 to the 24 fold amplification, it only grew to 24.7. That bias is less than the bias observed among some natural sequences. Okay, so at the single nucleotide level, we look unbiased. Now, I don't have time to really describe this in mathematical, but it turns out that something called correlations can hide biases at the single nucleotide level. Right? If you take GCAT, CATG, and all four permutations of that, there's only four sequences, but at each position, each nucleotide would be 25%. Okay, so it would, it would look random. But it's actually only four sequences. Because correlations, every time you have a G, it's followed by a C. Every time you have a C, it's followed by an A. And every time you have an A, it's followed by a T. Correlations hide biases. So we went through and did a, a statistical analysis of correlations. These are called heat maps, where we're looking at the sequence of, of a strand of DNA against the same sequence of that same, same strand of DNA. And we're saying, does the, sequence, does the nucleotide identity at any one position impact the identity of the, of, of the nucleotide at another position? So you see correlations by 10 to the 12 in both the retained and the lost. They grow in, and clearly they're just, this is a correlation between the minus 1 and the minus 2, and this is a correlation between the plus 1 and the plus 2. Maybe not a surprise. It's just a correlation between the dinucleotides that are immediately flanking the unnatural base pair. Now, we were first a little confused because this is a pretty deep statistical analysis, a lot of data here, and you see the correlation grow in here, and then it kind of grows out. And it kind of sneaks back in. What's going on there? Anyone who studies statistics knows what's going on here. We are looking so deep in the noise that we're seeing random fluctuations. 
These biases, these correlations are so small, we're just seeing random fluctuations in the population. To illustrate this, I'm showing a, a unit circle representation, where now F rel minus one is represented by a unit circle. In, in the, in, here's the dinucleotide that's five prime. Here's the dinucleotide that's three prime. Here's the population that retained the unnatural base pair. Here's the population that lost. And now color code shows the amplification level. So what you see is this bubbling out here represents an F rel minus one that's getting larger <coughs> as a function of amplification. So that's a bias for. Maybe you're seeing a little bit of collapse down here, and that's a bias against. But the largest bias here, which is now the only other bias, is right here. This is largely just reflecting this preference for a five prime C. So it's, pre it's preference for a five prime C, and then maybe a slight preference for a G, followed by a CC, followed by maybe a CT, and maybe last a CA. But a CG dinucleotide is the largest bias. Again, to illustrate how large this is, it's instructive to look at how much was there before and after the amplification. It started at 2.3%, and after 10 to the 24 whole amplification, it only grew to 3.5%. Okay. The biases observed with the unnatural base pair are less than those observed amongst some sequences of fully natural DNA. So we claimed in a paper, and the referees let us claim, that this was in vitro a fully functional unnatural base pair. All right, so we're getting pretty excited now. But now getting back to sort of like an, an important medicinal chemistry concept. So you go to a medicinal chemistry, it's like, I got a compound, and it kills bacteria or it kills cancer cells or whatever. Let's launch a million dollar effort to develop this as a drug. He'll say, well, what's the target? What's the target? And you say, well, who cares? I'm telling you it kills bacteria, or I'm telling you here's the activity. And he won't develop it, because medicinal chemistry have been faked out too many times on chasing ghosts, chasing artifacts, things that weren't real, they didn't pan out. Medicinal chemists want to know mechanisms of action, not because they're analytic and hyper careful or academic, because they want to understand what's going on to make sure they're not getting faked out. We want to approach the same thing here, the same, from the same perspective here. We would say, look, before we charge in vivo, do we really, if it's, because you know, it looks like we have a functional base pair, can we understand it to make sure that it's right? And this got problematic. It got problematic because we solved the structure in collaboration with my friend, with my friend Jamie Dwyer at USD, and there's the base pair, right there. This is an average of 20 NMR structures. Here's the average. Here's an overlay of 20 NMR structures. Here's the average structure. Remember that first generation analog that was cross strand matriculated? <clears throat> okay, again, they're still cross strand matriculated. This was a light bulb moment in my lab. It's like, look, they're never going to do this. There's nothing to be gained from doing this. There's no H bonds to be had. The DNA is going to do whatever it can do to be stable. And it's going to open up a little bit, not a lot, but just a little. It's going to twist and kink just a little to allow this. That's all that it can do to be there. So do I care? Well, here's the problem. Everyone knows, well, let me tell you how a DNA polymerase works. A DNA polymerase looks like a right hand. A template binds, a primer template binds, and then when the correct triphosphate binds, it induces a large conformational change of that polymerase so that the fingers domain close down over the palm and thumb domains. And it forms a very tight, structured complex that very rigorously selects for a correct Watson-Crick base pair structure. That's why all natural base pairs, G, C, C, G, T, A, and A, T, they all look the same. They all form this planar Watson-Crick structure. They all look like this. And that's what the polymerase is recognizing. Okay, this isn't what our base pair looks like. Our base pair looks like an AA mispair. So how is it that a polymerase is recognizing this? Are we getting faked out? Is there something weird going on? So I turned to a friend of mine, Andy Marks, from the University of Constance in Germany, and, and, and we solved some crystal structures together. So this is now the structure of, of a DNA polymerase called Clintac polymerase. It's, it's a canonical class, so-called class one family polymerase. The only part of the polymerase I'm showing here is the O and the O1 helix. They're the, they're the base of that fingers domain that I mentioned. So here's the primer, here's the template, and here's our poor little NAM analog flipped out of the developing duplex. No big deal, that's actually what the natural nucleobases do. We add the, our correct triphosphate and it flips back in. 
And, the, and you see this large conformational change of the O1 and the O helix. Now, to convince you that that's a large conformational change, here's an overlay of the two ternary structures. And you, there's that conformational change. To convince you that it's exactly the same as the conformational change induced by a natural base pair, here's an overlay of the same polymerase synthesizing R pair overlaid with the same polymerase synthesizing a GC pair. So you see that at the secondary structure level, they're identical. At the side chain level, they're virtually identical. Even at the water and bound magnesium ion level, they're, they're superimposing. So first question, our natural base pair does indeed induce the very same large conformational change that a natural base pair induces. Now the second question, what's it recognizing once it induces that structural change? It wants, it's supposed to be recognizing a Watson-Crick base pair, not a mis pair. So what's it now recognizing once it's induced that change? If your eyes are good, you can already see. If your eyes are like mine, let me help you. This was a good day in my life. A natural base pair is replicated with an induced fit mechanism. Its formation drives up large conformational change in the plumbers. The unnatural base pair is replicated with a very, very similar but subtly different mechanism. It's a mutual induced fit mechanism. Its formation drives that large polymerase conformational change, but it adopts to the environment produced with its own conformational change. I think this wound up being the luckiest thing about choosing hydrophobic interactions because they're strong, but they're non-directional. They're plastic. No other force, I don't think, would have allowed for the combination of strength and plasticity to drive the conformation will change and then adapt to it. So we are pretty excited about that. And with this sort of in vitro validation that I described earlier in terms of the PCR and et cetera, and this sort of mechanistic validation, we were only now willing to sort of venture into what our long-term goal has always been, and that is to use the unnatural base pair to develop it as the basis of a semi-synthetic organism that stores information past GCAT uh, and stores increased genetic information. So this is what I've been telling you about in vitro. How do we get this to work in vivo? How do we get this to work in a cell? So the first big challenge is this. How do you get the triphosphates into a cell? So I'm not going to bore you with about a year and a half of effort in my lab, other than to say, look, there are several literature methods that are obvious, that, are, that, that, you, would, that you would, there are obvious choices to try. If you look carefully, they're all for eukaryotic cells, mostly mammalian cells. They don't work in bacteria. So just for those of you who are thinking about this, free nucleosides do diffuse in. They do get metabolized up by the salvage first enzyme in the salvage pathway, the thymidylic kinase, up to the monophosphate. But they can't go further than the diphosphate. Protected triphosphates followed by nonspecific esterase cleavage once within a cell doesn't work. I don't think because they're, I don't think the E. coli has the nonspecific esterases to unmask them. So, we, so the standard methods didn't work. That's, that's the take home lesson. So we were faced needing to come up with a new way to get the triphosphates in. And this is where interdisciplinary science comes in handy. We made the observation, which was totally new to us, but it turns out, like a lot of science, this was actually known by a small group of people who work on this, that there's some genetic elements that have the property that I'm about to describe to you. And what that property is, is they replicate autonomously, independent of, um, they, they replicate on their own. But they don't encode the machinery for a triphosphate synthesis. So what these organisms, what, what these genetic elements are, are the, the genomes of several obligate intracellular bacteria and several organelles in eukaryotic cells. So what do those each have in common? Well, they each have in common the fact that they live in a cell that's full of everything they need. So there's selection pressure to pare down their genomes to work less and steal. So they scatter. Turns out what these elements that I just described do is they've lost the machinery of triphosphate synthesis in lieu of simply synthesizing a dedicated nucleoside triphosphate transporter that steals triphosphates from their host environment and brings them into their environment with, and, and then they use it for, for replication of their genome. So we said, look, maybe we could find one of these nucleoside triphosphate transporters that will import our unnatural triphosphate. So we looked at the literature. 
and found, sure enough, that there were several that looked pretty nonspecific. They said they import the triphosphates of GCA and T. That says there's not a lot of recognition of that nucleobase, so maybe we'll free to modify the nucleobase and, in fact, give them one of our nucleoside antibodies. So we wrote away to 18 labs across the world. Several of them were kind enough to send us plasmids. Um, we cloned them into our E. coli, our bacterial strain, and the first thing we want to say is, look, are they active? So the first screen was to simply add radio-labeled ATP and use scintillation counter because that's a quick, easy assay. This transporter right here was pretty active in our E. coli cells. In transporter one, this is the second of the nucleoside triphosphate transporters from this chlamydial uh, uh, algae species. So it's active. Now, in order for our strategy to work, the other thing, I don't want to dwell on this too much, is the triphosphates have to be stable in the media. They're totally stable in a PCR reaction. You can heat them up, but you put them in the presence of growing cells, and they start decomposing because cells are secreting phosphatases. You know, it's a pain in the ass. We're, we will solve the problem because we're in the process of tracking down what the phosphatases are, and we'll delete them. But we solved the problem temporarily by just adding potassium phosphate to the media because that shuts down the scavenging mechanisms or it actually might inhibit the, the enzymes themselves. We don't, we don't know. But you can see that the half-lives in the absence of potassium phosphate, um, the, 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 the uh, NAM triphosphate at, by two hours, well, by six hours, it's completely monophosphate. So this is tri, di, mono. And then by six hours, it's completely monophosphate. Adding, sorry, yeah, and adding potassium phosphate by, by six hours, you're still mostly triphosphate. 5,6 uh, is even worse in the absence of, of, of potassium phosphate. Um, you know, you're a th you're, 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 there's only a third left of triphosphate by two hours, and by, by six hours, it's completely gone. And when you add a, a 100 millimole of potassium phosphate, you're still um, mostly triphosphate by, by two hours and still triphosphate left at six. So the half-life is about six and nine hours with the added addition of potassium phosphate. So we believe that this was at least enough to give it a try. So we looked at the ability of the transporter, transporter that I just described to import the triphosphate. This is the, the data with A. So here's triphosphate. You can see, no, no, actually no one ever knew this. This is because no one had ever had a way to independently introduce a separate triphosphate pool into a cell. What you see is that here's the DATP. Only, D, only the triphosphate gets in. So you know it's decomposing to the dye and then the mono, and probably the nucleoside, but it's dark because this is radio labeled at the alpha position. So once the alpha phosphate's gone, you don't see it any longer. But this is showing for the first time that DATP has a, a life cycle. It turns over. It's constantly being made and, and by, by kinases and being then degraded by phosphatases, and it's probably part of a complex cellular regulatory mechanism but 5, 6, and NAM get into the cell as well. And of course, that's what we're excited about. And in fact, their turnover looks very much like ATP. And you can say, look, there's a lot of crap building up. And that's certainly true. And that's something that we're going to fix. But the important point is, is that this level of triphosphate for 5, 6, and this level of triphosphate for NAM were steady state levels that persisted for two to eight hours after providing 250 micromolar of, the, of each triphosphate to the medium. So that's where influx from the transporter is, is just balancing degradation by the phosphatases. So that meant that we had a pretty long period where we could maintain these levels of triphosphate in the cell. And those levels are 30 and 60 micromolar. That's an order of magnitude above the KM of the polymerases of the triphosphates for the polymerases. So physiologically, that should be enough. That's actually plenty. So that uh, encouraged us to actually take a shot on goal. So what we did is we constructed two plasmids. We call this PAX for accessory plasmid. That's a plasmid that we're going to store. We're going to code everything, all the accessory elements that we're going to need for our semi-synthetic organism. And right now, and that's like things like synthetases down the road. But right now, all it control, all it encodes is that transporter that I described. Now, this PIMP for information plasmid contains the unnatural base pair. Now, all it is is it's just PUC19. And anyone who does biotechnology knows PUC19. It's just a generic vector, just a generic plasmid. The only thing that we've done is replace a single AT at this site with an XY. Otherwise, it's just PUC19. Now, 
What I want to emphasize is that X, XY that we made by PCR in that plasmid was made, by T, was made with NAM and TPT3. So remember TPT3 at the beginning? It's a pair, it's a partner for NAM that's a little bit better than 5, 6. But we haven't characterized its fidelity, its, sorry, its sequence context, the structure, and all that that we've done with 5, 6 NAM. So when we constructed the plasmid, we constructed the unnatural base pair XY with this, which is different from this unnatural base pair. So, here, so, so when we grow the cells, the experiment is going to be done with the triphosphates of this and this. So that's going to come back to be important in a minute. So here's the experiment. Transform E. coli with that PAX plasmid, induce production of the transporter, add the unnatural triphosphates, and then transform in PIMP. Then recover PIMP, the plasmid, as a function of time, or maybe as a replication level or whatever, and characterize it, characterize retention of the unnatural base pair. So here are important controls. Transform with PUP19 instead of PIMP, which is identical, it just doesn't have the unnatural base pair. Don't induce the transporter, or don't add the unnatural triphosphates. Okay? Here's the first data. So we recovered the plasmid, we PCR amplified it using that same trick that I described earlier, we have the binding tag. So that should tag DNA and only DNA that has the unnatural base pair. DNA that's lost the unnatural base pair shouldn't be tagged. So only the DNA that has the unnatural base pair should be shifted on a streptavidin gel shift assay. So here's the data for the controls where the plasma that you give the cell doesn't have the unnatural base pair, it just has PUC19. Then it doesn't matter whether you induce the transporter or whether you give it the triphosphates or not, you get no gel shift. There's no unnatural base pair there. There's no biotin tag being a, tagging along with the unnatural base pair. Now if you do give the plasmid the unnatural base pair, if you do give the template the unnatural base pair, but you don't provide the triphosphates, then you don't get a gel shift. Now if you give the template the unnatural base pair and you give the triphosphates, but you don't, you don't induce transporter with IPTG, then you don't get a gel shift. Only if you give the template the unnatural base pair, you provide the triphosphates, and you induce the transporter to facilitate their uptake, only then you get a gel shift. And the calibration curve allowed us to say that, after, that, 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 that uh, the retention, the fidelity, was, nine, was greater than 99.4%. Now, to, con to confirm this, we, we, didn't, we, we took the same plasmid, and instead of amplifying with biotin tag, we just amplified with DX and DY triphosphates. And then we did that sequencing trick that I showed you earlier. So here are all the controls. You see a normal sequencing chromatogram. That's only natural DNA. But in the experiment, you see that abrupt termination at the position of the unnatural base pair. We were pretty excited. We thought we had unambiguously, with these controls, demonstrated in vivo replication of the unnatural base pair. So we submitted a paper. Two out of three reviewers agreed with us. One didn't. And on December 23rd, I, I read his review and it said, look, you've got to do something with mass spec that involves no manipulation of the plasma. Because I don't trust uh, this PCR step and the, and, and the earlier one. Because we're manipulating the plasma. Maybe that's doing something. I was kind of freaked out, it was December 23rd, my lab doesn't do mass spec, I emailed some people at NEB, New England Biolabs, and um, because they had reported an assay, an LCM SMS assay, where they analyzed a single epigenetic modification, like a methylation site, in a genome. I, and I said, could you guys do this with our unnatural base pair? Uh, December 26th, I got an email back, and they said that they already, our, our, it turns out our unnatural triphosphates are commercially available from a company called Barron Associates, so it turns out they had, they, I got an email back and said, okay, we've ordered the triphosphates, and here's a time schedule. And it was about three weeks. Now, three, anyone who has a collaboration, these collaborations are hard. And they didn't stick to the three weeks, because it turned out that this was a new assay for them, and they had to, to work some things out, and it took five weeks. Unbelievable. I owe them a real debt of gratitude. Here's their data. So what they did was they took the plasmid, unmanipulated, straight out of the cell, Digested it down to the free nucleosides. Put it through an LC and then an MSMS. So this is the signal for C. 
G and A and T. T gets mass ion suppressed, so it doesn't give you much of a signal, and that was known to them, so it was not a surprise. <coughs> and you just don't use it to calibrate. On top of each of them here is, a, is the experiment that controls. See way out here, this little guy, blow him up? Mm -hmm. One, five, six per plasmid. Five, six, not TPT3. The only place 5,6 was provided was as a triphosphate to the media. The synthetic plasmid was made with TPT3. This is unambiguous demonstration of in vivo replication within the organism. So that satisfied, the reviewer took that. And so I'm gonna make a slight joke here. I don't have time, so I can't make too many jokes, but um, so, so I, I was really excited because you know we got a little bit of press from this paper, and so I was, I, I was kind of, going out to lab saying, oh yeah, it's a real hassle. I had to talk to the San Diego Tribune today. <laughs> and I had this tech in my lab. She's like, well, yeah, you get asked to do an Ask Me Anything, and I'll be impressed. I was like, Ask Me Anything? Yeah, that, that's, that, I, I got this stupid email last week asking me to do this ridiculous internet thing. That can't be legit. <laughs> so anyone who's under 30 gets the joke. It turns out it is. Well, President Obama did an AMA. So I quickly emailed them back and said, oh, I'm sorry I've been out of town. I wasn't. <laughs> um, I, and we'd be delighted to do this. So we actually sat down on Reddit and did a, a, a full day. We actually were on the front page for a day and a half. Pretty exciting. And it was actually this really fun time where you have these live back and forth. And it turns out there was a moderator, and the only job was to delete religious comments. So <laughs> they pop up for a second, and then they disappear. Religious people can get angry. But anyway, we got some funny comments about what would Watson say about this. And okay, can they, but can they code for anything? What's the benefit? That was like, if there was a negative, that's what it was. I think they were all from George Church's lab. <laughs> I guess you grow a big woolly beard and you can do whatever you want. Um, it was really fun doing this, but clearly the Reddit readers, they wanted us to go on. So we thought, okay, let's move on. So we continued to make analogs. We're continuing to chemically optimize the unnatural base pair. And so now, by the since our last screen, we've made about 100 new analogs. So we ran another screen. This time it was 7,000 candidates, including first, second, and third generation now. We got a family of unnatural base pairs, all of which are better replicated than 5,6 NAM. And 5,6 NAM, I just showed you, is good enough for replication of this cell. So the reason this is so important is it's back to like med chem concepts. A medicinal chemist would never go into a drug development pro program with one compound. Because there are all sorts of other activities, things that they call pharmacokinetics. Things like toxicity, solubility, in our case, triphosphate uptake, off-target activity. These all have different physical chemical properties, and they're going to have different pharmacokinetic properties. So this is actually really nice to be able to have this sort of flexibility. Um, Couple exciting things. Now, what I didn't tell you was that, so that it, it's, so this transporter really saved our bacon. It was really, really a, a, a important for the project because it allowed us to get the triphosphates in. But it actually makes the cells sick. Because you're expressing this transporter, it's poking all these holes in the cell, it stinks, right? The cell's not happy about that. And so we had to encode it on a high copy plasmid because there was this pervasive selection pressure against keeping it. So if you put it on a single copy plasmid, you'll lose it because then the cells grow better. Of course, they'll lose the ability to take up the triphosphates and we're, we're dead in the water. So a graduate student in my lab noticed that, that these are eukaryotic proteins. They have an N-terminus that, incl that in includes an, uh, uh, an, ER an ER transit signal and a chloroplast localization signal. Now, I'm not a biologist, I'm a chemist, but I'm pretty sure that they're not doing anything in bacteria. They don't have ER or chloroplasts. So my student deleted them. Toxicity absolutely went away. What we think was happening was that N-terminus was just flank, was just dangling in the cytoplasm, probably triggering an unfolded protein response or, or just aggregating or God knows what. So this is now growth. This is our old system. And so what's important is the slope. The difference between this, this, and this in an absolute sense along here is irrelevant. It's just the inoculation level. What's important is the slope. So you see that the slope that for this new strain that we call Delta delta, because it's deleted both the chloroplast and the ER signal, grows as fast as the empty vector. And you see this, this reduced growth is that toxicity that I just mentioned. And the uptake is the, the triphosphate uptake is fine. We've now run these experiments so many times, they're indistinguishable. 
Because they're no longer toxic, we don't need to keep them on a high cap of plasmid, we integrated it into the chromosome, what we call I, and we optimized constitutive promoter use. We found the best promoter was a promoter called p like UV5. That's a constitutive promoter. So they know what this means now. This means that we can take ourselves out of the freezer, grow them up, and they're immediately competent for taking up our triphosphates. We don't have to induce them. We've removed one moving part from the system. And I think that's really, really important. What we can't wind up with is a Rube Goldberg machine. You put a marble in and ball drops, and in the end, a bird takes a drip from the, from the water after five minutes of things going on. We don't want that. We want a simple system. And this makes it more simple. So we now have cells that are naturally competent for taking up our triphosphates. We've removed that as an issue. Look, the Reddit readers really came down on us not doing anything. So we thought, okay, well, maybe we should try to do something with the unnatural base. So instead of avoiding a gene, we put it in the middle of the gene. We chose superfolder GFP. We put it behind a T7 promoter in front of a canonical T7 terminator. Now, we added the triphosphates of the deoxy and the ribo of X and Y. And we showed that the ribos also get in through our transporter. We induced T7 production, produced RNA, isolated the total cell population of RNA, then reverse transcribed it in vitro, and PCR amplified it with our biotin tag on the unnatural base. So think about what the unnatural base has to do here. It has to get in, it has to replicate, it has to transcribe into RNA, it then has to survive lysis, it has to then be synthesized into cDNA by the, by the notoriously error-prone reverse transcriptases, and then it has to PCR amplify. I'm going to end my talk with this slide, only where it's supposed to be. We've now done this with multiple different transcripts, and we're characterizing the fidelity now with NEB. Suffice it to say that, we can that, that all the data is that we can, that we can transcribe well. This was with T7 RNA polymerase. There's some really interesting possibilities of using E. coli's natural RNA polymerase. There's some really cool anti-termination mechanisms for the transcription aficionados in the room. Uh, that are going to be fun to play with, and they might allow for some additional facets of control. But suffice it to say, the transcription works well. And so now my group is examining the generality of that, and of course, most exciting, trying to get out of that next step to start to look at decoding at the ribosome, see if our natural base first can underlock, can be fully retrieved informationally in the form of, uh, of unnatural codon and anticodon pairs, which would, which would underlie synthesis of unnatural proteins, um, which has been the real launcher goal. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank you for, uh, again, for the kind invitation and for your attention. This is my group. I should call out the people, individuals who've been working on it. Uh, Ellie Diner is a, and, uh, and Brian Lamb are very talented postdocs. Mm -hmm.